Now previously, during these talks, during the Rains Retreat, I've been trying to explain various things about the 28 Buddhas around here and their relationship to our Buddha, Buddha Gautama. And we've talked about uh, some of them like Anomadasi and Padamuttara. And we also talked about uh, Vipassi and then about Buddha Metteya, the coming Buddha, which was the talk that we had last time. So another thing that's in this uh, Vihara are the Buddha relics. So today I want to tell you about how the Buddha relics came to be and how they came to be distributed and eventually land up in our temple. Okay? So, the Buddha passed away in Kusinara in the Mala country uh, between two sala trees. We call these trees here sala trees, but these are not the real sala trees. The sala trees are actually really beautiful, uh, but there's a confusion with these trees. Now, when long-lived Buddhas, actually most of them are long-lived, even Buddha Kasapa, who's the uh, Buddha before our Buddha, lived for 20,000 years. Our Buddha, of course, only lived for a hundred years. But when a long-lived Buddha passes away, then the relics that are found after the cremation, it's just one big golden ball like this. It's not broken into different pieces. It's just one big uh, golden ball and they have just one stupa or one chaitya where that uh, relic is put. But our Lord Buddha passed away during the short life of human beings at that time. They were only living for a hundred years. Our Buddha lived, of course, for only eighty years. Now, then, when uh, he passed away, he had managed to spread the sasana all throughout northeast India, but he hadn't managed to spread it throughout all of Jambudipa because um, he didn't have enough time, we can say. There wasn't enough time for it. So when our Buddha passed away, he left behind relics. So the relics act as like a surrogate for the Buddha, so that it makes the Buddha present uh, for us today. There are various things that make the Buddha present. The Buddha statues make the Buddha present. Yeah, The Bodhi tree makes the Buddha present. Um, you know, the chai tears, like this chai tear out here, make the Buddha present, and so do the relics behind us. So, when the Buddha was cremated, he had first been wrapped in 500 uh, cloths of, like, linen, uh, like this, and then he was cremated. The flames on that pyre, the pyre means a cremation uh, platform, the, the flames from that pyre were very high and very tall, but it said that none of the leaves and none of the insects, none of the animals around were uh, hurt or destroyed by the fire. It was only the Buddha's body uh, that was um, uh, cremated. So when they had cremated the body, they collected the relics, just as they do now. You will often see in Thailand, for instance, when somebody, when one monk has passed away, they make the cremation and they uh, collect the relics. The Buddha's relics were like a basket full, like a basket full like this. And uh, 
Now, the Malas, he had died in the Mala country. So the Malas believed those relics belonged to him, belonged to them, yeah? Because the Buddha had purposely gone to Kusinara to pass away, and he had chosen that place specifically. So the uh, Malas, the people called the Malas, they felt like, those relics belong to them. But others also wanted a share of the relics, particularly King Ajatasattu, who was the king of Magadha, which was this uh, evolving great kingdom that would eventually become the Mauryan Empire, which spread from Afghanistan to Bangladesh and from Nepal down to Karnataka. Um, that was the origin of um, that empire was in Magadha and that was a very big and rising uh, country at the time. So King Ajatasattu got his um, army together, the four, four parts of the army together and then he went up to Kusinara and he wanted a share but not only him but the Lichidis where the Buddha had spent the last rains retreat, they also wanted a share. And, of course, the Sakyans, the Buddha was a Sakyan, yeah? The Sakyans from Kapilavattu, they also wanted a share. Now, there was more people than that who wanted a share, but you remember these three, because these three are important, especially to our story. Um, then there was a Brahmin there, Brahmin Dona, and Dona said it's not right to fight over the relics of the Buddha because the Buddha was, peach, was teaching peace and harmony and so on like this. We shouldn't, as soon as the Buddha passes away, we shouldn't go for, to war over his relics. So he said, let me divide the relics and we will divide it between us and then we can all make stupas like this. So Dona was actually a kind of a very clever Brahmin and like most clever Brahmins, he took one of the teeth of the Buddha and he put it in his turban because he wanted to keep the tooth, you see. The, there's various parts of the Buddha that never, you know, normally when you cremate, everything breaks into little pieces, yeah? But the, the four of the teeth, it's actually the four I don't have, <laughs> the four of the teeth and the uh, forehead there and the collarbones, they didn't break but the rest broke into very small pieces, okay? Some are so small, they're the size of a sesame seed. That's like the smallest type of seed. And some are a bit bigger than that. But then, uh, Dona, thinking he had this tooth saved for himself in his turban, uh, he split up the rest of the material into eight different piles and then he passed them to uh, the various people who would come making a claim on the Buddha's relics and they uh, were happy then of course because they got their share and then after the distribution Dona looked for his tooth in his turban but Saka, the Lord of the Devas, had seen him put it there and he'd come down and he'd taken it. And Saka has a, a stupa in Tarvatimsa called Chulamani. And that's where this tooth of the Buddha is now kept. Another tooth of the Buddha, of course, is kept in the um, temple of the tooth in Kandy, 
some of you have been to Kandy or something. Right, that's where some of it is. One of the um, one of the collarbones is also in Sri Lanka, like this. Eventually, you know, Sri Lanka was not Buddhist really at that time. Eventually, those relics made their way down through different uh, difficulties and everything, and they eventually were brought to Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka became like um, the kind of uh, center of Buddhism at that time. So, Dona, he had used like a container uh, to divide up the relics. So Dona got to keep the container and then some other people who came late, they were too late for the distribution which had already been made. So they took the charcoal, that means the burned firewood, so all together there were 10 uh, relics after the passing away of the Buddha. That means eight sections, eight uh, kind of baskets if you like, and then the basket itself and the charcoal. Now Ajata Sattu, who was this great and big king, he decided to have a procession from Kusinara to uh, his home, uh, uh, his capital city in what was then called Rajgaha, which is now Rajgir. That's about 300 kilometers. And the story goes that this was such a magnificent uh, procession, it actually took seven years seven months and seven days for them to get the relic back from Kusinara all the way back to Rajgir. And then all these different distributions, they built shrines. You can still see some of them. You can see the ones at uh, Kapilavatu, you can see the ones at um, uh, Vaisali and so on, like this. So, uh, Ajata Sattu also built a, um, uh, a shrine for the relics. But not only that, but Maha Kasapa, who at that time was the most senior monk in the Sangha because Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahamogavana predeceased the Buddha. They passed away before the Buddha passed away. So Maha Kasapa was looked upon as the most senior of the monks in the Sangha and he had called the first council. Now he advised the Jatasattu to make a secret chamber for uh, some of the relics because he was Afraid, you know, even now uh, you'll often see in remote places that where they built chaitiyas, normally they put in gold, jewels, silver, all sorts of valuable objects. And thieves come along and then they break down the chaitiya and they steal it. Even now in Tibet, it's very common that the Chaitiyas, which are in very remote areas like this, that the Chaitiyas get broken and stolen from. When I was in Sri Lanka and the war was going on, uh, one of the main uh, stupas, a Somawati stupa, uh, was just behind the front line and that stupa was also broken uh, by thieves trying to find valuable objects. So Mahakaspa understood that this might happen, so he advised um, Ajatasattu to build a secret chamber under the ground where people wouldn't know where it was. And he put the majority of the relics were put there. Right? And he did that because he foresaw in the future that later a great king 
would arise. That's King Ashoka, who I talked to you about many times. And he foresaw that King Ashoka would, ar would arise and he would be looking for the relics. So about 200 years later, King Ashoka, who was then the king of all India, as I said before, from Afghanistan down to Bangladesh, from Nepal down to uh, Karnataka, he was a, a really uh, one of the great kings. India was much bigger during his time than it is during our time. He arose and he was converted by a, a novice uh, at one time and he became Buddhist. Before that he had engaged in wars and um, he had also killed all his brothers, uh, said to be 99 brothers, he had killed all 99 brothers, so it was a fratricide and he waged a war and about 100,000 people had died in the war in Arissa, uh, one of the states in um, North India, like this. But later he became a Buddhist and uh, then his whole character changed and he started supporting the Sasana and uh, did many good works. One of the good works was he built 84,000 temples throughout India. And when he had built those temples, he wanted relics for the stupas in those temples. So then, nobody knew where this secret chamber was. But one monk had heard from his father, who had also been a monk in his later life, that there was some secret place underneath the 80 stupas that Ajatasattu had built for the 80 great disciples. So they went and they had a look and then they got inside and they managed to find this secret chamber of, uh, that contained the relics and then those relics were distributed all over India uh, into the 84,000 temples that Ahsoka built. When they opened the chamber, a wonderful thing happened. When they had closed the chamber, they had lit incense and they had put flowers and they had put lights, just like we do on the Buddha table. But when they opened it, 200 years later, the flowers were still fresh, the fire was still burning, or the lamp was still burning, and the incense uh, was still there as well. So uh, when they opened it, there was this wonderful um, uh, sight in front of them. Now then, I told you not only Ajata Sattu uh, got some relics, but they also got some relics in, for the Sakyans in Kapilavatu. Now, uh, a long time ago, 25 years ago, or more than that, uh, we had a monk here, Sri Sumangala. Some of you actually are old enough to remember Sri Sumangala. He was a very great uh, monk, a Tripitaka Acharya, and that means he could teach the whole Tripitaka uh, and he was a, not only a, a very learned monk, but he was also well connected. And somehow, but I don't know the whole story of this, but somehow he managed to get a connection to Kapilawatu. And he went to Kapilawatu and he talked to the monks who were there uh, in the temple near the pilgrimage centers. Uh, he talked to the monks who were there and they gave him a relic from the original uh, collection of relics that was um, uh, given to them at the time of the passing of the Lord Buddha. And then he brought that relic back and it's kept here. 
it's kept here in our safe actually because uh, it's very valuable obviously uh, for one thing and it's only normally shown once a year at Besak we get it out in a ceremony and then we usually put up the um, display cabinet over here and then we display the uh, the relic so that's the story of what happened to the Buddha's relics after he passed away and it's also a short story of how we come to be in possession of the relic which is basically through the good offices of uh, Sri Sumangala who was our previous um, uh, resident monk in this temple so everybody say sadhu